All right, so good afternoon, class. Uh, I want to start off by just reminding you that your homework, your first homework is due tonight. So if you click in the online classroom, if you click the tab called homework, you can either have a Word document or a PDF. Um, and you, you, know, you can do it by hand or you can type your work in, anything like that. Um, before I get started with the lecture, does anybody have uh, any questions about uh, any of the specific problems on the homework at all before I get started? No questions, everybody okay with it? I saw a few people have already gone and submitted it. No questions today, huh? Okay. I do take Word. Um, you can even do some of this stuff in Microsoft Excel if you want to. I'm okay with that. Um, but long, I will take any file format that I can open. So like a Word document, a PDF. If you have to submit it as a JPEG, I can open JPEGs. But what I can't open are things like dot .pages. Um, I don't know, some of the other formats I can't open. So if, as long as I can open the file, I will accept it. All right. So no other questions then? So in the classroom today, under course content, um, I'm gonna go through lectures number four and lectures number five. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, how many people have the TI-84 or TI-83 calculator with them today? Okay. I'm going to show you how to use your calculator. Um, if you don't have it, you definitely need it for ne next week. That's okay if you'll get it tomorrow. Um, but so I'm going to show on the TI-84 today. The options are the exact same on the TI-83. Okay. Um, so just, just follow along if you have the TI-83 is totally fine, but I'm just going to show the TI-84. Um, we're going to do a lot of stuff by hand initially first today, just a few problems by hand, and then I'm going to show you how to do a lot of this stuff, most of this stuff with your uh, graphing calculator. Okay. All right. So if there's no other questions, um, I would uh, like to get started. So today's lecture is... Um, it's the last lecture in section number one of our course. Okay, it's the last time I'm going to talk about uh, some type of both numerical and a visual summary of data. And then next week, what we're going to do is next week, we're going to start section two of the class, um, which is um, correlation and regression. And then just real quick, going back, if you look back in the classroom under our course outline, uh, so next week, we, we're going to do correlation and regression. And then the following Tuesday after that, we're going to have our first exam. So I'll talk more and a lot more detail on your first exam next Tuesday. And I'll also post like a practice exam and stuff for you too. And I'll also post your next homework for you then too. Okay. So what we're going to talk about first today is what are called a five number summary for data. Okay. And then this concept of this five number summary, the visual representation of this is going to be what we call a box plot. You might also have heard this referred to as a box and whisker plot. Okay, how many people have maybe heard of a box plot before? Yeah, you, and you guys have all probably seen a box plot before, but what we're gonna talk about is exactly what they show, how to construct them. And um, all right, before we get into um, the, the what is exactly a box plot in the five number summary, I wanna go back and talk about a measure of spread here or a measure of dispersion. Okay, what we saw last class was that the measure of dispersion 
uh, that goes, uh, so last class, the measure of dispersion that goes with uh, the mean was what we call the standard deviation. Right, like when you had when we had this formula for the standard deviation, we did you know each x value minus um, um, minus the mean. Um, so there's another really important measure of central tendency, and that was the median from last class. So we're going to talk a lot about the median today. And it turns out the measure of spread that works with the median is what is called the interquartile range. And I'm just going to call this interquartile range the IQR in class always. Okay. And this measure of spread is a lot better than just the range in general, because we talked about the range isn't really that good, um, because it's not affected by what we call extreme values or outliers. All right. We're going to define and talk about outliers a lot today. Okay, so interquartile. So there's a couple. There's a couple words here. Interquartile and range. Well, we know what a range is. A range is some type of subtraction of a high value minus a low value. Okay, that's what a range is. Inter. So is some inner part. So we have this new word quartile. Okay, and when you hear the word quartile. Um, I think, you know, quartile, you think of quarters. Okay, that's what I think about when I read the word quartile. So to be able to talk about this thing called the interquartile range, and then eventually how it relates to box plots up here. Okay, we have to first start by defining what exactly quartiles are for a data set. Okay, so what exactly are quartiles? So I'm just going to put up here quarters of a data set. Okay, so the first thing you do uh, when you have a data set, how you find these quartiles is you arrange it in increasing order. Okay, and then I'm going to leave this, um, this next part here. I'm going to skip it for a little bit and I want to just talk about what the quartiles are. So a data set has um, three quartiles. We call the first quartile quartile one, we call the second quartile quartile two, and we call the third quartile um, Q3. Or we call the first quartile Q1, excuse me, second quartile Q2, third quartile Q3. And when you're going to do this by hand, okay, so the first few problems we're actually going to do by hand, okay, you always find the second quartile first. And all the second quartile is for a data set is it's just the median of the data set. Okay, does anybody remember exactly what a median for a data set is? What is the median? How do we define it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's the middle, okay? So the way I like to think about it in terms of quarters is it's 50% of data is below Q2. So the second quarter, when you think of quarters, you think of like 25%, okay? So Q2 is 50% of data is below it. Next, we're gonna find Q1. And the way you find Q1 is it's the median of the bottom half of data. Well, if the second quartile is 50% of data is below it, what percentage of data do you think is below the first quartile? If 50% for the second, how many for the first quarter? Yeah, thank you. So the first quartile means 25% of data is below it. Okay, and all the first quartile is, it's the medium of the bottom half of data. Median of the bottom half of data. Well, quartile three, if first quartile is 25% of data is below it, Second quartile is 50% of data is below it. What do you guys think the third quartile is? Yep, yep. Third 
Thank you all. Yeah. 75% of data is just below quartile three, all right? And actually, when we're gonna find the third quartile by hand, it's just the median of the top half of data. That's it, that's all you have to do. All right, once we define the quartiles, we can define this thing called the interquartile range, this IQR. So the IQR, all it is is the difference between whatever value you find for the third quartile minus the value of the first quartile, that's it. So really what this inner quartile range is, is it's the range of the middle 50% of data. Okay, that's all the interquartile ranges. So a, a, a range of a data set is just the max value minus the lowest, but what the interquartile range does is it says, whoa, 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 okay, okay. You know, data sets sometimes have outliers or extreme values. Um, so what is the range of that middle, just that middle 50% of data? That's all the interquartile range does. Okay, and don't stress too much. We're going to get a lot of practice doing all this stuff and finding quartiles. So if it seems a little weird right now, I promise you it's, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so how you do this, right? How you find the quartiles for a data set. First thing you're going to do is you're going to arrange the data in increasing order. Okay, so if I give you a data set, always just take it and put it in increasing order. Always, always, always find Q2 first. Okay, divide the data set into two halves. Okay, and I'll show you how to do this. Then you're going to find Q1, median of bottom half of data. And then you're just gonna find Q3, which is the median of top half of data. Once you find the quartiles, you're able to now find what we call this five number summary of a data set, right? And the five number summary of a data set is the three quartiles, Q1, Q2, Q3. And then what it also includes is you list the minimum value of a data set, the lowest value, and the maximum value of a data set. And it turns out that you can take this five number summary and the visual representation of this, of this five number summary, is a box plot. Okay, so that's exactly what a box plot shows. Okay, it shows what are the quartiles of your data set, what is the minimum value, and what is the maximum value. It turns out that the box plot also kind of shows the interquartile range visually, and you'll see that when we construct our first box plot by hand. Okay, I know you've heard me yapping for a bit, um, but does anybody have any questions before we get into our first example of this. Kind of like drinking from a fire hose so far. Nothing in the chat. Everybody's ready for football this weekend. Okay. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I wanna do this by hand. So I wanna take this data set here Sorry you don't like football. Um, as a side note, we have a Formula One race Sunday morning if people like that. I like that. I like, it's going to be a good Sunday for me. Got racing and football. It's going to be awesome. Um, all right. Anyways, let's go back to this. So you have this data set here. And it can be a data set of whatever you want. doesn't matter. All right. Um, and just have these numbers here. And what I want to do is I want to take this data and the first things I want to do is I want to find the median in the quartiles for this data below. Okay. So it looks like it's the numbers 12, 6, 4, 9, 8, 4, 9, 8, 5, 9, 8, and 10, whatever, just these numbers. What do you think the first thing we should do with this data set is if we want to find the quartiles? Yep, arrange it from lowest to highest. So here, I'm going to do that. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you how to find the median. So the next after you do that, oh, let me go 
go back. You're going to find Q2 first. Okay. And I showed you how to do this with what's called the n plus one divided by two position. So you're going to count how many data values there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, right? Two, four, six, eight, ten. So there's twelve plus one divided by two. What is thirteen divided by two get you? Okay, so, yep, thank you. So what that means is the median occurs in position 6.5. Here's position one, here's position two, three, four, five. Here's position six, here's position seven. So that means our second quartile Q2 goes right here. So what you do then is you take the average of the two values. Well, this is pretty easy. What's the average of eight and eight? I got it. It's eight. Okay. So then what you're going to do next, you're going to find quartile one. And to do that, all you're going to do is you're going to look at the bottom half of data right here. Okay. So Q1 is the median of bottom half. All right, this, with this small, very small data set, uh, you can just eyeball this, okay? Can anybody in the chat tell me what the median of this is? Anybody got a guess? A uh, close, yeah, it's five, it's not, it's between five and six, so it's gonna be right here. All right, and what is the average of five and six? If you were to take five plus six, you get 11 divided by two, How did I get the 12? Um, N plus one divided by two is the number of observations, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's where that 12 came from right there. That's how I found the first. Like if you wanted to do the N plus one divided by two for the bottom half, you would go one, two, three, four, there's six values. Six plus one is seven divided by two. I'd go to position one, two, three. I'd go to position 3.5 and you'd find the, the, the median there. Then next, after that, you find Q3, quartile three. So that's just the median of this top half of data here. Okay, so the median would occur, there's one, two, three, four, five, six values here. So the median would occur between nine and nine. Well, the average of nine and nine is just nine. So I've got quartile one, quartile two, and quartile three. And if you have the slides printed out, you can see I have them right there, okay? Next, what we can find, we can find that what I call the interquartile range, the IQR. Okay. Does anybody remember from the slides here what I said the formula was for that? Yep, it's just Q3 minus Q1. So that's just 9 minus 5.5. What does that get you? I think 3.5, yeah. So that, this is the interquartile range. You can see with this red line here, it's just the range of this middle 50% of data. And it's just that number 3.5. All right, I know, I know it seems like a lot, but we are gonna do another one of these. Um, but did it kind of make sense how I did that? And don't worry, we're gonna do another one of these. We're actually gonna do a bunch of this stuff today. All right, I've got the quartiles, okay? 5.5, 8, and 9, all right? What I wanna do now is I wanna draw the box plot of this, okay? And remember, the box plot is the visual of the five number summary. OK, 
okay? So the five number summary was Q1, Q2, and Q3. And what other values for the five number summary? Does anybody remember in the chat? Yep, thank you. And the min and max values. So to do this, what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a number line, okay? Okay, and your number line should like go from the lowest value to the highest value, okay? Uh, we'll do one where I don't give it to you here. We do it by hand. I'll show you how to just make it, pick a number line very easily. So what you do is you start by going to the first quartile, which is the number 5.5, .5, and you're gonna draw a vertical line. You're gonna to go to the upper quartile, which is nine. You're gonna draw another vertical line, and then you're gonna connect these with a the box, okay? What's really interesting is, is the length of this box, the length of this rectangle, rectangle is the IQR. Then where, where the median is, eight, you're gonna go in and you're also gonna draw the median in right there inside the box. So I've got Q1, Q2, and Q3 on the box. Now you need to show the minimum and the maximum value. Well, the minimum value of our data set, uh, I'm sorry, Marcos, I don't, um, uh, go, all right, going back real quick, uh, how I got the upper quartile, is you just cover up the median and you just look at the top half of data here. So if I were to look at this data set here um, of eight, nine, 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 10, and 12, uh, Liliana, I'm answering your question first here, how I got nine. Well, you would take the median of this. Well, the median would occur between these two values here. And you would take the average of the number nine and nine, well, the average of that of nine plus nine is 18 divided by two would get you nine. Does that make sense? Okay. And we're gonna get to practice this again, so don't stress. All right, so going here, next what you're gonna do is after you've drawn the box that shows where Q1, Q2, and Q3 is, your minimum value of the data set is four. You're gonna draw another vertical line and you draw a a whisker out to it. This is why it's sometimes called a, a box and whisker plot with the minimum value. And then my max value was 12. So I draw another vertical line out here. And this is why it's called a five number summary. I've got the min, the first quartile, the second quartile, the third quartile, and the max. All right. And you can see here, I also have it in the slides for you a little bit, a little bit nicer there. Not too bad. I, I understand, Pamela, I, pre I appreciate that. Eh. All right, that's no, okay. Let's just do one more by hand and then I've got some good news for you, okay? I'll, I'll show everyone um, a little bit how to do the stuff with the calculator, okay? All right, so here's a second example, all right? So I've got this set of data. Six, three, nine, eight, four, ten, eight, four, fifteen, eight, and ten. Okay. Uh, what's the um, uh, what's the first thing you should do? Yep, you should just order the data. So I'm going to do that like so. All right. So you're going to find Q2 first. Always, always. So I'm going to do this by hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 11 data values. Okay. So the median Q2 will occur in position n plus one divided by two, which is 11 plus one divided by two, which means go to position six in your data. One, two, three, four, five. Here's position six. This is my second quartile. Okay. 
Now what you're gonna do to find the first quartile is you're just gonna look at the bottom half of data. So you're just gonna cover up, you're not gonna count the median, you're just gonna look at these five values here. Okay, what is the median of this data set here at the bottom half? Yep, it's just the number four, right? Because there's five data values, one, two, three, four, five. So the median occurs right in the middle of this. It's the value four, okay? Because you're covering it up. You're only looking at this bottom half here. Now to find Q3, you look at this bottom, this half up here. Yep, thank you, Tor. Yep, Q3 is the value 10. You can then find the interquartile range, which is Q3 minus Q1, which is 10 minus four, which gets you six. Not too bad. All right, and I promise you, you know what, if you don't like doing this by hand, what we're gonna do next is I'm gonna show you in, in a little bit, not exactly next, but in a little bit, I'll show us how to do it with the calculator and it makes this even 10 times easier. All right, but now let's draw the box plot for this. So you're gonna draw your number line. Okay, the lowest value in this data set was three, the highest was 15. So you're gonna to go to your first quartile, Q1. You're gonna to go to your third quartile, which was 10. You're gonna draw the box from Q1 to Q3 here. You're gonna draw where the median is inside. Another vertical line that represents the median, so that's Q2. Then you're gonna go down to the minimum value here and draw a whisker out to it, minimum. And then you're gonna go out to 15. And then you're gonna draw maximum value. Okay, so here you go, boom. You just drew this nice box plot for it. All right. Think you could maybe handle one of those on your next homework, maybe on the first exam? Okay, good, good, good. All right, so I want to just talk um, about, you know, what are some uses of these box and whiskers or box plots? Um, really what they're, a real good thing for it. And Paulina, to answer your, your next question, I'm actually gonna show you how to even make these easier with the calculator. I, once we do the calculator, I promise you it'll be a lot easier, um, is comparing data sets. That's one good use of it. So like, suppose I have this data set of um, heights of boys and girls in middle school, right? Like you can just look at the two data sets here and you know what, like, what can you conclude from this? You know, boys are generally taller in middle school. Okay, just, just by looking at the two box plots. All right, you can even compare three data sets here, like Seattle, San Antonio, and New York, if you just want to look at weather patterns, right? Like Seattle's, you know, generally pretty mild, San Antonio's pretty hot, and New York's all over the place here. Okay. And just by looking at the data set, you know, you, you, the box plots, you can conclude that. Box plots can also tell us if data is right skewed, left skewed, or normally distributed. And if you look here, we, last class, we talked about uh, histogram skews. Or, or two classes ago, excuse me. But anyways, if you look at a, um, a box plot and you see this, this one whisker that shoots off way to the right, okay, 
it probably means your data is right skewed. If you have your whiskers that look symmetric, like this, both are equal length, this kind of looks like a normal curve or normal distribution. This bell curve. And then the opposite here, if you have this tail or this whisker that shoots off to the left here, it means your distribution is probably left skewed. Okay, so that's just one another usefulness of these box plots. They can tell you if they're skewed to your data or not. Okay, where we're gonna spend probably the next half an hour or so is on this concept of outliers, okay? And outliers are these unusual or extreme values. All right. And it is really important to identify outliers. Okay. The reason being is outliers influence the mean and standard deviation of a data set a lot, okay? So a data set can have, when, when you look at a data set, it can have, this is important, no outliers, one outliers, or several outliers, All right? And this is another important thing that sometimes um, people don't realize. Um, you can be an extreme value or an outlier by being very low or very high compared to other values. Okay, so you can have outliers both ways. Okay, both ways, high and low. So you have to test, you have to find um, a way to do this. So you can identify outliers using what we call upper and lower limits. And sometimes you'll hear me refer to them as upper and lower cutoffs instead. Okay, so that's just the cutoffs and limits, they're just synonymous with each other. Um, so just sometimes I'll mix it up, okay. And I have these formulas here and there is no scientific reason behind these formulas. I wish I could tell you there was. This, these are just formulas that statisticians have agreed to over time to, to identifying if a data value in a data set is an outlier. All right, so when I ask you, and, and we're going to do an example in a bit, to find outliers in a data set, you have to check both ways, okay? So the, the value for the lower limit, or remember, I'll call it sometimes the lower cutoff, is you take the first quartile and you subtract 1.5 times the IQR. And what does the IQR stand for again? It's the interquartile range and it's just Q3. Yep, thank you, minus Q1. So that's why we calculated it before. And then you have this upper cutoff, all right, or upper limit. And this is just Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. That's it, okay? And what happens is if you have a value, if you have a data value below the lower limit, or a data value above the upper limit, they are outliers. Okay. All right, so now I, I've been talking about how um, you use your graphing calculator for all this stuff. So what I want to do now is I want to do one big example, all of us together, okay? And this is an example of um, 
something that I would ask on your first exam and what you'll get on your on your on your next homework. Okay. So if you're kind of paying attention or kind of not paying attention, have me in the background or something. Um, I, I encourage you to just really pay attention to this next part. Okay. It's, uh, this is if there if there's like one thing that's really important in today's lecture. It's this example right here. Okay. All right. If you have your graphing calculator, take it out as well, because this is where we're going to use um, our graphing calculator for this problem. All right, so what I want to do for this is I want to construct a box plot, okay, from these TV viewing times. Now imagine this is just a sample from WCC students last night, okay? And basically I said, hey, how many minutes of television did you watch last night, okay? So looking at the data set here, okay, somebody watched for 25 minutes, 35, 31, someone for five, someone for 66 minutes. Looking at the data set, are there any values that look unusual or extreme in the data set overall? Okay, yep, I agree, 66 looks extreme, right? Like maybe this is an outlier. Is there any other, yeah, and I agree, thank you. All right, so there looks like there might be, now this is important, there might be two outliers here, okay? You don't know for sure, okay? You, we have to go through and test, but 66 does seem high and five minutes does seem pretty low, okay? So you, you'll get a data set like this, and the first question might be something like this. Find the quartiles for the data. All right, so if you were to do this by hand, what you would do is you would, um, you know, arrange all this data from, high, from lowest to highest and then go do it by hand and it sounds terrible. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm actually gonna show you now how to use your graphing calculator for this. Can everybody see my, my graphing calculator here on the screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so what I'm actually gonna do with everybody, if you don't mind following along, um, I want us to all reset our calculators. So we're all on the, you're distracted by my amazing background. This guy here, my cat, not my cat, but just a, a cat with glasses. Thank you for that. I don't know why I picked that background. I hate cats actually. I just found it very funny, okay. You're getting a glimpse into my life. <laughs> I don't know why. All right. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to um, reset our calculators. So please follow these instructions very carefully. The way you reset a calculator, if you looked at, and this is the same with the TI-83, by the way, okay? There's this option here called MEM, this stands for memory. So everyone hit second function on your calculator and then memory. And then you should see option number seven on your calculator for reset. Okay, so just press number seven. It's gonna ask you what you wanna reset. I'm gonna do um, option number one, all RAM. So what this does is this clears out your calculator like any any data, anything you had in it, it clears it out. So I'm gonna press number one. And then it's gonna ask you if you wanna do this. You're gonna press number two for reset. Okay, so it's second function memory and then you can just literally press seven, one, two. Okay. Now, if you wanna input data into your calculator, um, does anybody remember what, uh, what button you press for this? Yep, so I'm gonna press stat. And under number one for edit the list, I'm just gonna press enter. Liliana, was it with resetting that you got lost? Yeah. Okay, no problem. So just hit second function memory. Are you there? Uh, where do you find them? Okay. 
I'm sorry? I got it. Did you get it? Yes or no? No, you said second memory and then? And then just press seven, one, two. And you should see something like this on your screen. Yeah, I got it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So next hit the stat button on your calculator. And under number one, we're gonna edit the list. And the reason I wanted to reset it is because it's really important. You should see L1 here, okay, on your calculator, All right? If anybody does not see L1 here, what you'll have to do is you'll have to come to my office hours and I'll have to troubleshoot your calculator for you. Okay, but you should see L1 here. Now what you're gonna do is just gonna take these 20 data values and plug them in. So 25, 66, 34, 30, 41, 35, 26, 38. It's a little, little arduous to do this, but you know, or not even arduous, just time consuming. So you should, it takes a while to plug them all in, okay? But you should get 20 data values in there. And plugging them in your calculator is a lot better than um, uh, even just uh, arranging them by hand, okay? So I'll give you a second to continue plugging them in your calculator. I don't understand your question. How do you, what do you mean? How do you pull up the box? How do you pull this box up that you're seeing here? Is this what you're asking? Yep, so you hit stat and then under edit, it's number one. And then you should see that. Yep. Okay. And at this point, if you're still struggling, just, just follow me for a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll do another one of these again in a second, okay? So next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the stat button on my calculator, all right? Because now what I want the calculator to do is I want it to do all the calculations for me. So I'm gonna hit stat, and I'm gonna scroll over to calc right here, calc. And under calc going forward, the only things we'll ever use are one var stats, two dar stats, two var stats in linreg ax plus b we're going to we're going to use the linreg next week but we have one variable we have tv times of student watch so this one dash var stat number 1 here i'm just going to hit enter now if you have a ti83 if you have a ti83 what it says here is one dash var stats just hit enter again okay if you have a ti84 like i do scroll down to calculate and hit enter now, how many people see what I have on the screen there? Okay. If your values are a little off, generally what that means is you just inputted one of the prop, one of the values wrong. Like where, where you were supposed to input 15, you put in like 13 or something, okay? So this is the mean, remember? S sub X is the sample standard deviation. Sigma sub X is the population standard deviation. All right, so just to go back, Paulina, you went stat, you went over to calc, and then it was just number one. So just press one on your calculator. And then you go down to calculate, or if you have a TI-83, just hit enter again, and this is what you should see. All right, Paulina, and we'll do this again in a second, okay? So don't stress. All right, good. So population standard deviation, if you see this arrow, you can scroll down and look right here, it tells you the five number summary. It tells you what the min, what quartile one is. Remember the median is quartile two and quartile three. This is the population standard deviation. So if your data set was a population, it would be a population standard deviation. No problem. Okay, so 
we did two problems by hand. Is it so much easier with your calculator? Yeah, it's just like so much easier with your calculator. Okay, so just keep this handy. Quartile one was 23, quartile two was 30.5, and quartile three was 36.5. All right, so going back here, what are the quartiles? Q1, I believe it was 23. Quartile two was 30.5. And quartile three was 36.5. Great. Next, let's find the interquartile range. Okay, the IQR. So the interquartile range was just Q3 minus Q1. So that's 36.5 minus 23. I think that gets you 13 point, yep, thank you, Tor, 13.5. All right, the next thing I wanna do, okay, is I want to identify any outliers in the data set. Well, hold on, hold on. This is why you have to be careful, okay? These are, right now, maybe we think they're outliers. So what you have to do whenever I say outliers is you have to find these upper and lower limits first, okay? And then I'll show you how to use them, okay? These upper and lower limits. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna find the lower limit. Okay, and the formula for that was Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR, okay? This is why we found quartile one, it's 23. Minus 1.5, this is why we found the IQR, which was 13.5. If you plug that into your calculator, just for time, I'll do this for us. I believe you get 2.75. I don't know if anybody plugged that into their calculator, but that's what you'll get. Okay, thank you. So what that means is look back at your data set. Is there any value that is below 2.75? Yeah, there, five is not below it. So what that means, even though five looks like an outlier, it is not an outlier. Okay, that's why it's super important to test this data set. Now we need to check for the 66. So the upper limit here, well, the formula for that is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. Okay, well, that's 36.5 plus 1.5 times 13.5, right? Q3 was 36.5. So if you plug this in your calculator, you get, I'm going to quickly do this in my head, I think you get 56.75. Did anybody do that in their calculator? All right, thank you. Uh, yes, I actually didn't do it in my head. I actually have it written down right here. Okay, just a little bit of a joke. So look at the data set. All right, is there any value in the data set above the value 56.75? Yeah, okay, so what that means is yes, the value of 66 is an outlier. Okay, it's an outlier. Next, once we know that there's an outlier in our data set, let's sketch the box plot. With any outlier. Okay, because when you have an, a, a, an outlier in your data set, um, how you sketch it is um, a little bit different, okay? All right, so our lowest value is five and our highest value is 66. So if I'm gonna do this by hand, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a number line and I'm gonna start it here at zero and I'm just gonna go every 10. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and here's 70, okay? 
I went a little bit too far, but I'll just go like that by tens. All right, it's okay to eyeball this. This doesn't have to be perfect, all right, just so we're clear. So the first thing you would do is you'd go to Q1 and you'd put 23. So wherever you think 23 is, you'd put a vertical line, okay? Then you'd go to Q3, okay, which is the value 36.5. And you put another vertical line like this, and then you connect the box. Okay, so what you're seeing here is you're seeing Q1 and Q3. Now inside the box, you put Q2, which is 30.5, which is kind of like right there. Now, what was the minimum value in this data set? Okay, five, and it's not an outlier. So you go to the number five, then you draw a whisker out to it, and that's the minimum value. Now, how you show 66, the outlier on a box plot, is a little different. So you're gonna go to the number 66, and you're gonna put a little asterisk, okay? What that tells me is this value is an outlier, okay? Next, what you do is you still have to draw the right whisker here. So looking at your data set, what is the next highest value um, below 66? Is it, is it 43? That's the next highest value? Yeah. I don't think I see any others. So what you then do is you draw the whisker out to the number 43. And this is your max value that's not an outlier like this. Not too bad. So it's really the same thing we just did, um, but when we did the two by hands, um, but we just had to identify the outlier, okay? Yeah, I don't think, I, I, it's not too bad. I do just wanna show you one last thing on your calculator here. Turns out your calculator can also produce statistical graphs for you. Okay, so I wanna show you how to do this because we're gonna actually do your calculate, use our calculator for statistical graphs a lot next week. So take out your calculator. You should still have the data plugged in. And do you see this option here called stat plot on your calculator? It's above the Y equal sign. Okay, everybody see that stat plot? It's the same with the TI-83 too, okay? So your calculator in, in, in its default settings um, does not have stat plot turned on, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna turn stat plot on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit second function and then Y equals, so second function stat plot. Okay, so we should all, we should all see something like this. Okay, and do you notice how it says plot one dot 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 off? Are people with me on that? Okay, I'm just gonna hit enter and notice where it says here, where it says on and it's blinking, I just wanna hit enter again. So now that it's on. All right, these are all different types of graphs that your calculator does for you. Okay, this one right here is called the scatter plot. We're gonna learn that next week. Uh, hey, there's the histograms. And if you look right here, it looks like we have a box plot and then those dots are with an outlier. And this is a box plot without the outliers. So I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna highlight this right here because we had the box plot with the outliers. That's what we just saw here. And I'm gonna hit enter. All right, next, what you normally do when you wanna have a calculator show you what the graph looks like is you just hit the graph button, okay? But if I hit the graph button on my calculator, this is what I see. It only looks like I see the tail end. And that's because your calculator's default setting to the uh, center of the Cartesian plane. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit zoom 
and you want number nine on your calculator. So on the TI-83, you might have to scroll down till you find ZoomStat, but you want this option called ZoomStat. And look right here. This is what the calculator says the box plot looks like. This is what I did it by hand, okay? Does this box plot look a lot like mine down here? I mean, we can all agree mine's better, right? Obviously, um, but yeah, we got the, the two box plots there. So the good news is your calculator does a lot of this, which is, which is fantastic. All right, what do you guys think? Easy with the calculator? Yes, it's, I agree, it's just way easier. So what I just wanna do is I just wanna quick do um, one more example of this. I, it's okay with everybody. Uh, we're actually gonna skip our break today um, and we're gonna get out a little bit early. Um, I hope that's okay with everybody. Does anybody have any issues with that? Okay, actually, so actually, just, um, let me just do this. I take that back. Let's just take a break and, and it'll be a super short break. So it's, it's uh, 157. Let's just take a three minute break. I know I'm so indecisive. My wife hates it. That is exactly right, Torah. I do need coffee. You're, you're, you're not wrong. Okay. That's really what's going on here. Uh, so uh, let's, yes, it is a coffee run. I'm going to go, stop talking to me. I'm going to go on a coffee run. We'll be back in two minutes and then we'll finish up for today. All right, uh, let's start back. Um, I did get a coffee run and I do, did need my coffee, so I'm, I'm much better. Uh, so what I wanna do here now is, I just wanna do one more quick example of this again, because you just saw me do, uh, we went through it really quickly. This question is gonna be on your next exam and on your um, next homework. So let's just do another one here, okay?
So I want to do an example about commute times. And I'm going to change it. Um, usually when we have this class in person, I ask people what their uh, commute times are. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to do um, some of Matt's commute times. Yeah, this is exactly what a test question would look like. Okay, a test question would literally look like this, um, but now I'm just doing another one. Okay, and I will post an old an old test for you so you can see. Okay, does that sound okay? All right, so let me just give you some data. Okay, so normally when I um, when I drive to work, so I live in New Jersey. So sometimes when I drive to work, it can take me, you know, depending on how fast I go, you know, it can take me 40 minutes, 45 minutes, sometimes another 45 minutes, sometimes 55, sometimes 60, another 60, 65, sometimes it takes me 70 minutes. Eight. You know, we'll, we'll add a few more in there. So this, this is just a sample of sometimes how long it takes me to get to work. Okay. So let me give you two other times. Okay, so I live in a place called Morristown, New Jersey. And uh, sometimes I actually take public transit to work, believe it or not. And when I do that, I usually do it once or twice a semester, uh, just because I like going into the city. This was before COVID. Um, and what I would have to do is I'd have to take New Jersey transit from Morristown to Penn Station. Then I'd have to catch the seven train to um, Grand Central Station. And then I would have to catch Metro North to White Plains, and then I'd have to catch the 40 bus from White Plains to campus. Okay, so it was really long. Yeah, it was fun. No, it was it was fun. I would bring a book. I stop. I get coffee and a bagel. It's it's actually it's actually really peaceful. It's it's mat time. Uh, actually, generally, you know, too much TMI today. But usually, it's generally when I want to hang out with somebody in the city after work, and I don't want to drive. Yep. So I'm going to tell you how long it takes. If I don't miss any connections. Okay, I time it perfectly. It takes me 180 minutes, so it takes me three hours. Okay, so it's kind of long, um, but that's yeah, not bad. But my commute now is really nice. How long do you think it takes me now today to get to work? How many minutes? Yeah, zero minutes. Okay, I don't know if I uh, live at work or work at home. I can't. I, I don't know anymore. Okay. So I do love public transit, it saves the environment. Anyways, let's, let's go on to this. So looking at the data set here, um, are, are there any values that look like they might be outliers? Yeah, 180, are there any other ones? Yeah, maybe the zero, okay. So let's, let's go do the same thing here, okay. Let's find the quartiles for the data set here. So again, what I want to do is I want to take this data set and I want to plug it into my graphing calculator here. Okay. So I'm going to hit the stat button. And under number one, I want to edit. Now this is incredibly important. I want to show you how to clear data. You're going to go scroll up to the top L1. Do not, listen to me, do not hit delete. Do not hit delete, don't. We're never gonna use the delete button. You're gonna scroll to L1, you're gonna hit clear and then enter, okay? Clear, then enter. Now you're gonna take your, your values and you're gonna start plugging them in. 40, 45, add another 45, 55. 60, 60, 65, 70, 70, 60, 62, 180, and then my commute now of zero, okay? Now I wanna have my calculator do all this stuff for me, okay? Now what button do I press again? I press stat, 
I'm going to scroll over to calc and it's number one for one dash var stats. Okay, I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to scroll down to calculate and you should see something like this. Okay, how many people who are following along got this? Okay, great. So it looks like Q1 here is 45, Q2 is 60, and Q3 is 67.5, okay? Uh, Liliana, you don't have to press that anymore. Uh, did you want to reset your calculator again for some reason? We're not resetting our calculator. But no, I, I don't know how to get to the where you put every value again. How yep, to yep. Do, do you see the stat button? Mm -hmm. Press stat. Under edit, it's number one. You're just going to hit enter. Mm -hmm. And then what you want to do is you want to scroll to the top and hit clear enter to be able to re-put the data. Okay. And I have to delete one by one. No, no, you, you, you scroll to the top and hit clear. Don't use the delete button. The good news is uh, I'm going to post this recording right after class. It's going to take me about an hour to, to render the video and then post it to YouTube, but then you can go back and watch me redo all this again. Is that okay? Okay. So we got the core tiles here. Q1 was 45, Q2 was 60, and Q3 was 67.5. All right, let's find the interquartile range here, okay? So the IQR is just Q3 minus Q1, which is 67.5 minus 45. Can anybody tell me what that is? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to test for outliers or find outliers. So you need to do both these cutoffs or these limits. So the lower limit formula was Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR, which was 45 minus 1.5 times this IQR we just found. And I actually didn't work this problem out ahead of time. Can somebody with a calculator who's following along help me out? I'd really, really appreciate it. Just so I don't have to exit out of this. Thank you, Pamela. I appreciate that. So the lower cutoff is 11.5. All right, so is there any value in the data set below that? Yeah, okay, there is. So that means this value of zero is an outlier, okay? Now let's find the upper limit, which is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, which is 67.5 plus 1.5 times 22.5. And Pamela, I hate to put you on the spot again, but you were really quick there. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate the help. So any value above 101.25 is an outlier. So this is an outlier here. 
So next, what I want to do is I just want to sketch the box plot with outliers. And I just want to show you how to do this when you have such extreme values and then a bunch of data like really close together so that it doesn't look silly. So I'm going to start my number line at zero. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this sign. Okay, what this means is break. Okay, it means go to zero and then break. And then I'm going to pick up, okay, at, ah, go, come on, go back. 40, and then I have to go all the way up to 70. So I'll go by fives, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70. And then I'm going to draw this other sign here, which means do another break in your line. And then I'll go like, you know, 170, 175, 180. Okay, so now I have an out, a box plot with two outliers. You can always have more than one. All right, so go to Q1, 45. Go to Q3, which is 67.5. You can also have none, yep. So I have Q1, Q3. Q2 is 60, so I'm gonna to go to 60. I'm gonna draw here for Q2. Now we knew zero was an outlier, so I'm gonna put an asterisk here, okay? Then what you do next, you have to draw a bottom whisker. You go to the next lowest value that is not an outlier, which is 40. So you're gonna draw the whisker down to 40. You're gonna go up to 180 and draw the outlier. And then you're gonna to go to the next highest value that is not an outlier, which is 70. And you're gonna draw the whisker out to it there. And that's what this box plot would look like. Your graphing calculator can also do this. Like if I just go back to my graphing calculator here, the data is already plugged in for this example. All right, so if you just go on your calculator, if you had the data plugged in and hit zoom, and then zoom stat number nine, you can see their box plot in relation to mine. And, they, and that identifies both outliers correctly. And then the box plot looks like mine. All right, thank you guys. Now that I've done two examples, I think these are okay. You'll be able to handle these on the exam and stuff. Okay. I get good vibes. I think you'll all do okay. You're going to get a chance to practice this on the homework and I'll also post it on the practice exam for you too. So you'll get a chance to practice on your own. I'm not going to do it in class right now. Yes. You need to get a calculator, especially next week. Next week is going to be a lot, a lot of calculator work. Okay, so it definitely you need to have that handy next week and we're going to be changing a lot of default options on your calculator. So, you know, just make sure everybody has that handy next week. Okay, um, I'm going to leave this example for yourself for just extra practice. Um, but what I have here is I have a data set of the ages of actresses uh, when they won their first Oscar. Um, and I want and what I did here was I gave you the summary statistics for you already. So I just want you on your own to identify and see if there's any outliers for this. Okay, I won't waste time in class on it just so you have an extra one for yourself here. Okay. And I'll give you a hint. There's no when you do this problem, there's going to be no low outliers, but there's going to be a bunch of high outliers. Okay. All right, let's move on and talk now about our final um, a topic in today's lecture, this is z-scores, okay? And what z-scores tell us is they're basically a measure 
of position of a data value in the data set. Z-scores um, are going to be um, a very, very simple topic, a very, very simple calculation to do, um, but they're gonna be incredibly important. So Z-scores, will come up a lot when we get to sections four and five of the class. Okay, like when we start talking about in section four, the normal distribution, and in section five, when we get to hypothesis testing. you're gonna see these z-scores come up a lot again, okay? And in this section here, what, um, what we use z-scores for is we're gonna use them for a relative comparison, All right? And I have an example here that I hope uh, shows why we need um, a relative comparison for a data set here. All right, so what I want to do here is I want to consider two teachers and I want to consider their salaries or two teacher salaries. Okay. So you have teacher Jeff here and Jeff makes $70,000 a year. And you have teacher Nicole who makes $60,000 a year. Okay. Just looking at their income, who would you say is doing better? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jeff makes Jeff makes more money. So we're, we would say just just this, and I'll talk about why this might be an unfair comparison. But just just by looking at the income. Jeff is better off. Okay. But this might be an unfair comparison, okay? Like we don't know what school districts they work in. We, I, I, I don't know. It, there's a lot of information that's missing here, okay? So let me give you some extra info, okay, with this. Jeff, Jeff lives in New York City, okay? So in New York City, he makes $70,000 a year. And Nicole lives in Albany, New York. Okay, I picked Albany, New York, because that's where I grew up, okay? So when you see this, okay? Who would you say is doing better? Who's better off? Why would you say Nicole? Yeah, why are you guys saying Nicole? So it's tough, right? Like Jeff, it is. So just by looking at cost of living, right? Um, uh, obviously, New York, Albany is a little bit cheaper, a little bit, a lot cheaper than New York City. Um, but Jeff does make $10,000 more a year. Um, is that enough to offset it? So what we see here is it's an unfair direct comparison. Okay, just by looking at income, it's, it, it, it's tough, okay? So it's better to compare what we call their relative positions to their peers. And to do this, what we need is we need a little bit of extra information, okay? We'll need to know the mean and we'll need to know the standard deviation for teacher salaries in their location. And the mean we'll use is we will use the Greek letter mu, the population mean, and the standard deviation we'll use the Greek letter sigma, okay? So now just, just let me put this back up here. Jeff was making 70 grand a year. And Nicole was making uh, 60 grand a year. Yeah, it does, it probably doesn't go to just his apartment. Okay. So looking here, let's, I'm now, I just made these numbers up by the way. Okay, I don't know what the actual teacher salary is in New York City or Albany, I just made these numbers up. So don't think that these are true numbers, okay? 
Uh, the mean teacher salary, let's just assume in New York City that the mean is 80 and the standard deviation is 20. In Albany, the mean is 50 and the standard deviation is 5,000. So relative to their peers, okay? Okay, relative to their peers, who's doing better? And why? Can anybody tell me relative to their peers, who's better off and why? Yeah, I don't know if it's Jeff, right? So like, what is the average salary in, in uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the average salary, what we're saying in New York City is 80,000 for teachers. And Jeff is like making less than the mean, okay? No, no problem. Um, but like the average teacher salary in Albany is 50, but is Nicole making more? Yeah, she's above the mean. Yes, exactly. So Nicole is better off relative to her peers. Because you know what, it is an unfair direct comparison, right? Like he, Jeff makes $10,000 more, but right, like I can say this because I grew up outside of Albany, like New York City is just better than Albany, right? So like, even though it's less money, uh, Nicole's money will go further, like Jeff, um, Jeff gets all the amenities of New York City, okay? So it's, it's really an unfair direct comparison. That's why I just have to say relative to their peers, okay? And based on income, Nicole is better off. All right, so we got that, it was Nicole. And now what we wanna do now is, it's one thing to just look at it and say, oh, obviously, obviously Nicole's better off. What we wanna do is we wanna put a calculation to this. So we wanna put a numerical value to this, okay? And this numerical value that we're gonna talk about now uh, is what's called the standardized variable, okay? And you see below, I'm gonna sometimes refer to this as the Z-score. I'll always actually refer to it as the Z-score. All right, so for a variable X, and what our variable here is gonna be is gonna be the respective incomes for this example, okay? Then we define this new variable that we call Z. Okay, this is the Z score. And it's the value of the variable that's what X is. You subtract away. Does anybody remember what I said the Greek letter mu stood for? Uh, population what? Yep, that's the mean, minus the mean, okay? So minus the mean, and what did I say sigma was? Standard DV, yep. So divided by the standard deviation. Okay, this Z-score is a unitless measure All right, I'll show you with the first example what I mean by unitless measure. And really what it's telling you is it's telling you how far from the mean a data value is in terms of the number of standard deviations. Okay, how far data value is from the mean in terms of the number of standard deviations. So what I'm getting at here is if like you have a data value of, if you get a z-score of one, that means you're one standard deviation above the mean. If you get a z-score of minus 0.3, that means you're 0.3 standard deviations below the mean. Okay, so this calculation, whenever you take a random variable x and you run it through this formula, this new variable is called the z-score. of the variable X, okay? You might hear it referred to as the standard score, but I'm always just gonna call it the Z score, okay? 
All right, so let's work through the example here and actually show with this z-score concept that Nicole is better off. Okay, so let's calculate the z-scores for each of these people. Okay, so here's Jeff's z-score, okay? It's always, the formula is always this, the variable value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So he was making $70,000 a year. The average teacher salary was 80,000 and the standard deviation was 20,000. So if you do this subtraction, you get minus $10,000 divided by $20,000. And this is why I say these z-scores are unitless because dollars divided by dollars cancel. And this is minus one half or Jeff is making half a standard deviation below the mean. standard deviations below the mean relative to his peers. Okay, so Jeff is, you know, he's not, uh, he's not doing so great, okay? But you look at Nicole, right? Nicole's value, she was making $60,000 a year, okay? The average salary was 50,000, so 60,000 minus 50,000 is 10,000. The standard deviation in Albany was $5,000 a year. Dollars, dollars cancel. 10,000 divided by 5,000 is two. So Nicole's killing it out there. Nicole is making two standard deviations above the mean relative to her peers. So seeing it like this, does it kind of show a little bit better that indeed Nicole is better off relative to her peers? Okay. It's always important to say she's better off relative to her peers, right? Like, you know, because it, it, you can't just say, oh, Je Nicole's just better off in general, because like there's some intangible value of living in New York City compared to some intangible value of living in Albany that you can't quantify. So just relative to her peers, she's better off. Not too bad? Okay, uh, we'll do one more example here. All right, let's just do this example and then I just wanna end class talking about your homework real quickly, okay? All right, uh, so we have two students, okay? It looks like we have the student Mark and we have this student Steve in this example, okay? So Mark took a calculus final exam and Mark scored a 71. So that's Mark's X value on his exam, he scored a 71. The mean exam score for this calculus, so the mean, mu, the average was a 76, Ugh, so he did a little below the mean. And the standard deviation for exam scores in this calculus, final was five. All right, Steve took an economics final exam and he got a 75. So Steve got higher on his um, final exam than Mark. Okay, but why is it an unfair direct comparison? Like is, is a calculus class generally a little bit harder than an economics class, do you think? Yep, different courses, yep. So it turns out that the average, ooh, the average in the economics class was an 88 with a standard deviation of 10. So the question is this, who did relatively better? Whenever you see a problem that says who did relatively better, you need to calculate the z-scores, okay? You need to calculate the z-scores for these. So let's do the z-score for Mark. Well, it's always the x value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So he scored a 71 minus the 76 mean divided by five standard deviation. So this gets, I think, minus five divided by five. So Mark did one standard deviation below the mean relative to his peers, okay? Now the z-score for Steve, 
is x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation again. So he did a 75 minus the average was an 88, yikes. Divided by the standard deviation was 10. So this is minus 13 over 10. So he was 1.3 standard deviations below the mean. So who did better relative to their peers? Yeah, Mark did. He's, he's not as far away from the mean as Steve. Okay. Z score is not too bad. Pretty straightforward. I think you could handle one of these on uh, on a homework or a. Uh, uh, how did I get this minus five right here? It's uh, you take his x value here. Minus the mean. Seventy one minus seventy six gets you minus five. That's where that came from. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Let me just talk about your homework real quick. So your homework is due tonight um, by 11.59 p.m. So to submit your homework, you're just gonna click on this. You're going to browse to wherever the file is that you have, homework number one, whatever. You'll just select it and you will just hit submit, okay? You are more than welcome. A few people sent me questions asking about this. You're more than welcome to construct the graphs in Excel if you know how to. Um, uh, yeah, you're, you're more than welcome to do that if you want. Otherwise, just write, write it by hand and scan it in and you're good to go. Are there any last minute uh, questions about the homework or anything? Yeah, you can draw it in Word, whatever, it's fine. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. You can draw it on paper, whatever you want. Um,